A young man wanted to ensure that his virgin bride's sexual inexperience wouldn't be a cause of any tension or trouble. One evening, as they sat together, the young man decided to address this delicate topic. He gently explained to his bride that he didn't want her to ever feel pressured or obligated to have sex with him. He emphasized that any physical intimacy should come naturally and willingly from her side. I want you to be completely comfortable with me, he said, and I want it to always be your choice. The bride responded with a smile. That's so sweet of you. I really appreciate your understanding and care. Wanting to make things as easy and comfortable as possible for her, the young man came up with a clever idea. He kissed her on the nose affectionately and said, As a matter of fact, darling, I've thought of a simple way for us to communicate in bed without any awkwardness. I've devised a little code. His bride looked at him curiously, intrigued by the idea of a code. He continued, Here's how it works. When we're in bed at night and you want to have sex, you can tell me by pulling my prick once. But if you don't want to have sex, just pull my prick 100 times. In a small cozy home, there lived a couple who had been married for over 60 years. They had weathered all of life's storms side by side, talking openly about everything and anything. However, there was just one exception, a mysterious shoebox that the wife kept in the top of her closet. She had always told her husband never to open it or ask her about it, and for all these years he had respected her wish. As time passed, they grew older together, cherishing each moment. But one day, the inevitable shadow of life's end appeared. The wife fell gravely ill, and the doctor gave a somber prognosis. She would not recover. Amidst the sadness and preparations, the husband remembered the mysterious shoebox that had sat unopened for decades. Feeling that the time had finally come to unveil the secret of the box, the old man retrieved it from the closet and brought it to his wife's bedside. With heavy heart, she nodded, indicating that it was time for him to learn what she had kept hidden for so long. The husband opened the box. Inside, he found two delicately crocheted dolls and a stack of money totaling $10,000. Confused and intrigued, he turned to his wife, his eyes filled with questions. The old woman, gathering her strength, began to explain. When we were about to be married, she said softly, my grandmother shared with me the secret of a happy marriage. She told me never to argue, but instead if I ever got angry with you, I should keep quiet and crochet a doll. Tears welled up in the old man's eyes as he looked at the two crocheted dolls in the box. He was deeply moved, realizing that in all their years of marriage, she had only been angry with him twice. Overwhelmed with emotion, he said, Honey, this explains the dolls, but what about all this money? Where did it come from? The wife, with a faint smile, replied, Oh, Bat, I made that by selling the dolls. On a beautiful, tranquil evening, a husband and wife decided to spend some quality time together. They sat on their porch, which overlooked a lovely garden, enjoying the peaceful atmosphere. As they relaxed, they sipped on glasses of fine wine, enjoying the flavor and the serene moment it created. The wife, feeling particularly affectionate and content in that moment, turned to her husband with a soft smile. She felt a surge of love and appreciation for him and the life they shared. So she gently said to him, I love you. The husband turned to his wife with a mischievous glimmer in his eye and asked, Is that you or the wine talking? The wife, quick-witted and not missing a beat, looked at her glass of wine, then back at her husband and replied with a smirk, It's me talking to the wine. God was observing the happenings on earth. He noticed that the behavior of people was becoming increasingly troublesome and mischievous. Concerned about the state of humanity, God decided to get a first-hand report on the situation. He summoned one of his angels and sent him down to earth to observe and report back. The angel, dutiful and swift, descended to earth, mingling among the people, witnessing their actions and deeds. After some time, the angel returned to heaven and presented his findings to God. Yes, it is quite bad on earth, the angel reported. I found that 95% of people are misbehaving and indulging in wrongdoings, while only a small fraction, 5%, are upholding good virtues. God, pondering deeply upon hearing this, decided to seek a second opinion for confirmation. He called upon another angel and dispatched him to earth with the same mission. This second angel, equally observant and meticulous, went down to earth, conducted his observations, and returned to heaven. Upon his return, the second angel confirmed the first angel's report. He said to God, 
Yes, it's true. Earth is indeed in a state of moral decline. 95% of the people are indeed misbehaving, but there is still a small beacon of hope. 5% are still good and virtuous. God, though disheartened by these reports, was not without hope. He decided to take action to encourage and support the 5% who were still good. In an effort to boost their spirits and acknowledge their righteousness, God decided to send an email to these virtuous souls. He wanted to send them words of encouragement and let them know that their goodness was seen and appreciated. Do you know what the email said? No. Well, that's okay. I didn't get one either. Little Johnny happened to walk into the bathroom just as his dad was stepping out of the shower. Being a curious young boy, Johnny couldn't help but notice something unfamiliar. He saw something hanging between his dad's legs that he had never seen before. Johnny pointed and asked his dad, Dad, what's that hanging between your legs? His dad, caught a bit off guard by the question but wanting to give a simple answer that Johnny might understand, quickly thought of a response. Oh Johnny, that's my nerve. He said, hoping this explanation would satisfy his young son's curiosity. The next day, Johnny went to school, still thinking about what his dad had told him. During one of the classes, he found himself in a bit of a predicament. He really needed to use the bathroom. So he raised his hand and said to his teacher, Miss, I really need to go to the bathroom. The teacher, busy with another student at the time, responded, Not yet, Johnny. There's someone already in the bathroom. Please wait a little longer. But Johnny couldn't wait any longer. The urge was too strong. In a moment of desperation, he walked over to the garbage can in the corner of the classroom and started to pee right there. The teacher exclaimed, Johnny, you have some nerve. Johnny responded, that's nothing. You should see my father's. Dr. Durbin was a highly respected figure in the world of cardiology, known internationally for his groundbreaking work. He had spent years building his reputation, starting from his academic roots in his hometown, where he earned both his Ph.D. and M.D. to his successful practice in the bustling city of New York. His career reached a pinnacle when he authored a revolutionary medical paper that caught the attention of the global medical community. As a result, he was invited to present his paper at a prestigious international medical conference, which, by a twist of fate, was being held in his very own hometown. The conference was a grand event, taking place in the town's elegant opera house. The attendees were distinguished figures from around the world, dressed in their finest attire, men in sharp tuxedos and women in exquisite gowns. Dr. Durbin, seated among these esteemed guests, felt a mix of pride and nervous anticipation as he awaited his turn to speak. However, as the moment for his speech drew near, Dr. Durbin's nerves started to get the better of him. He felt a growing discomfort in his stomach, a telltale sign of his anxiety. This discomfort soon escalated into an urgent need to relieve himself. Just as he was contemplating a quick dash to the restroom, his name was called to the stage. With no time to spare, Dr. Durbin approached the lectern, his mind racing and his stomach churning. As he set up his papers and prepared to address the audience, he accidentally dropped his pen. Bending over to retrieve it, he positioned himself in such a way that his rear end was perilously close to the microphone. At that unfortunate moment, his body betrayed him. A loud, monstrous fart erupted. The sound was so powerful it seemed to shake the very foundations of the opera house, echoing off the walls and causing a stir among the audience. To make matters worse, it became immediately apparent, both from the sound and the spreading stain on his pants, that the situation was more severe than a mere fart. Humiliated and in complete shock, Dr. Durbin fled the stage, rushing out of the back door of the opera house. He vowed never to return to his hometown again, unable to face the embarrassment of what had just transpired. Years went by, and life continued. The memory of that day haunted Dr. Durbin, preventing him from returning home, even as he yearned to see his beloved town. Eventually, a family emergency compelled him to return. His mother had fallen ill, and he knew he had to be there for her. He checked into a local hotel under an assumed name, Dr. Haynes, hoping to avoid recognition. However, upon his arrival, a bright and friendly young hotel clerk greeted him at the reception desk. The clerk struck up a conversation. Good evening, Dr. Haynes. Have you ever been to our lovely town before? Dr. Jurban, feeling a pang of nostalgia, replied, Yes, as a matter of fact, I grew up here but I haven't visited in a long time. The clerk, curious, asked, Why not? Dr. Durbin hesitated but then shared, Well, a number of years ago, something really embarrassing happened here. 
I didn't think I could ever come back and face the people of this town. The clerk, trying to be helpful, offered some advice. I know you're a distinguished doctor, and I'm just a kid, but let me tell you something. Often, when I do something embarrassing, it turns out nobody else even noticed. Maybe that's true for whatever you think is so embarrassing. Dr. Durbin replied, No, I doubt anyone has forgotten this. The young clerk, still unaware of who he was talking to, asked, Was it a long time ago? Yes, it was quite a long time ago, the doctor confirmed. Then, with a sense of irony, the clerk asked, Was it before or after the Gerben fart? In a quaint little town, there lived a couple deeply in love. The man, completely smitten with his girlfriend, Wendy, decided to take their relationship to the next level. One romantic evening, under a starlit sky, he got down on one knee and asked Wendy to marry him. Wendy set a unique condition. She asked him to prove his love by getting her name tattooed on his prick. When it was erect, the tattoo would read Wendy, and when it wasn't, it would simply show why. The man, truly in love and willing to go to great lengths for Wendy, agreed to her request. After getting the tattoo, they were overjoyed with how it turned out and soon got married in a beautiful ceremony. For their honeymoon, they decided to go to a picturesque beach in Jamaica, a perfect destination to celebrate their love. The sandy beaches, the soothing sound of the waves, and the tropical climate made for a blissful getaway. One sunny day, as they lounged on the beach, Wendy asked her husband to fetch them some drinks. He walked over to a nearby stand on the beach, manned by a local Jamaican. As the man ordered their drinks, he noticed something quite peculiar. The Jamaican waiter also had a Y tattooed on his prick. Amused by this coincidence, he said to the waiter, Oh, you must have a wife named Wendy too. The waiter, with a friendly smile, replied, No, my tattoo says. Welcome to Jamaica, man. Have a nice day. <laughs> on a particularly busy day in the city, a woman found herself boarding an overcrowded bus. The bus was so packed that there was not a single seat available. Resigned to standing, the woman made her way through the crowd and managed to find a spot where she could hold onto one of the poles to keep her balance as the bus trundled along its route. As she stood there, it was hard not to notice that she had very hairy underarms. This was quite evident because she was holding onto the pole above her head, making her underarms clearly visible to those nearby. Among the passengers standing close to her was a man who appeared to be inebriated. He seemed to have had a few too many drinks and was swaying slightly with the motion of the bus. The drunk man, noticing the woman's underarms, couldn't help but stare. He stared at her for a good three minutes, taking in the sight with a mix of fascination and inebriation. Finally, mustering up some slurred courage, the drunk man decided to speak to the woman. He leaned towards her and said with a slight hiccup, I love a woman who does aerobics. The woman replied quite angrily, I don't do aerobics. The drunk man, however, was unfazed by her response. He squinted at her underarms again and then, with a confused and drunken smirk, said, Then how did you get your leg up so high? A wife was busily preparing breakfast, the aroma of fresh coffee and sizzling bacon filling the air. Her husband, feeling a bit playful, walked up to her. As she flipped pancakes on the stove, he stuck up behind her and gave her a cheeky pinch on her behind. With a teasing tone, he remarked, If you firmed up your butt, we could probably say goodbye to your girdle. The wife, hearing this, felt a mix of annoyance and indignation, but she chose to hold her tongue and continue with her cooking. The following morning, as the couple found themselves in the kitchen again, the husband, still in a teasing mood, decided to double down on his playful critique. As his wife reached for the cereal, he gave her breast a light pinch and said with a smirk, If you firm these up, we could definitely get rid of your bra. This time, the wife decided not to let the comment slide. Quick as a flash, she reached down and grabbed her husband's prick. She looked him straight in the eye and retorted sharply, And if you firm this up, we could get rid of the mailman, the gardener, the pool man, and your brother. A young, newlywed blonde bride, filled with dreams of starting a family with her husband, found herself facing an unexpected challenge. Despite their best efforts and many months of trying, she was unable to get pregnant. Concerned and seeking answers, she decided to make an appointment with a gynecologist. On the day of her appointment, the young bride entered the doctor's office feeling a mix of hope and nervousness. She was eager for any advice or treatment that could help her achieve her dream of having a baby. She sat in the examination room, her hands clasped nervously in her lap, 
and explained her situation to the doctor. We've been trying for months now, and I don't seem to be able to get pregnant, she said, her voice tinged with a hint of misery and frustration. The doctor offered her words of reassurance. I'm sure we'll solve your problem. He went to conduct a thorough examination to get to the root of the issue. If you'll just take off your clothes and get up on the examination table. The young bride, a bit embarrassed, nodded in agreement. However, as she prepared to get onto the table, she added, Well, all right, but I'd rather have my husband's baby. Jim and Jonah, who had never met before, decided to take a chance on love and set up a blind date. They chose to meet at a popular Italian restaurant. Both were excited and a little nervous about the evening, hoping to make a good impression on each other. As they sat down at a candlelit table, surrounded by the inviting aroma of Italian spices, they perused the menu. Jim decided to order the lasagna, a house specialty, while Joanna, wanting something classic, chose the spaghetti. Both dishes were notoriously messy to eat, especially in a setting where one wanted to appear poised and elegant. As they engaged in conversation, getting to know each other, they began to eat their meals. Despite trying to be careful, Italian cuisine had its challenges. A stray drop of tomato sauce from Jonah's spaghetti splattered onto her pristine white top. The sauce stood out glaringly against the fabric, and Jonah, embarrassed, let out a small, exasperated sigh. Oh my, look at that. I'm a pig, Jonah exclaimed, pointing out the stain on her top. Jim, who had been focused on his lasagna, looked up at Jonah's comment. Without thinking much about the sensitivity of the situation, he nodded in agreement as he continued to eat. You also have a drop of tomato sauce on your top. Jim isn't out of the hospital yet, and it may be a few weeks before he gets out. Sherlock Holmes, the famous detective and his loyal companion, Dr. Watson, decided to take a break from their usual adventures in London and explore the natural beauty of the backwoods of Kentucky. They planned a camping trip, looking forward to the tranquility and simplicity of the outdoors. After a long day of hiking, they set up their campsite in a peaceful clearing. As the evening settled in, they had a hearty dinner accompanied by a bottle of fine wine. Content and tired from the day's activities, they eventually go to sleep. Some hours into the night, Sherlock abruptly awoke. The detective, ever observant, noticed something amiss. He gently nudged Watson, who was sound asleep beside him. Watson, look out at the sky and tell me what you see. Watson, groggy but compliant, opened his eyes and said, I see millions of stars. Sherlock, with his characteristic curiosity, asked, And what do you deduce from that? Astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo. Horologically, I deduce that the time is approximately a quarter past three. Theologically, I can see that God is all-powerful and that we are small and insignificant. Meteorologically, I suspect that we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. He then looked at Sherlock and asked, And what does it tell you, Sherlock? Sherlock paused for a moment, then responded, Watson, you can poop. It tells me someone has stolen our tent. Two billionaire friends, who hadn't seen each other in a while, decided to catch up over lunch. They chose a fancy restaurant, one befitting their status, and settled in for what was expected to be a pleasant afternoon. As they enjoyed their gourmet meals, they chatted about various topics, business, travel, and the latest in technology. Eventually, the conversation turned a bit more personal. One of them, curious about his friend's family life, finally asked, So, how is your home life? With a bright smile, the other billionaire replied, Couldn't be better. I made an unusual but fantastic purchase. I bought an elephant. The first billionaire looked at his friend in astonishment. An elephant? Have you lost your mind? He asked, unable to hide his surprise. The proud owner of the elephant, far from being deterred by his friend's reaction, enthusiastically began to explain why buying the elephant was a great decision. Oh man, let me tell you, it's the best purchase of my life. He grazes on my lawn, making it nice and even. The kids absolutely adore him. They spend hours riding on his back and sliding down his trunk, which keeps them active and away from their screens. My wife finds him incredibly useful too. He's super strong and helps her move heavy things around when I'm not home. And above all, he's kind and smart. Truly the best pet I've ever had. The other billionaire, intrigued by this glowing endorsement, asked, That does sound quite amazing, actually. 
How much did you pay for him? A million bucks. Worth every penny. He was a steal at that price, the elephant owner boasted. Sensing an opportunity, the other billionaire offered. Sell him to me for two million? No way. Sell him? He's like family, the elephant owner replied, initially dismissive of the idea. But as the offer increased, three million, and then five million, the temptation became too great. Finally, the elephant owner agreed. Five million? Well, okay, I'll sell him to you, but only because we're friends. A few weeks later, the two billionaires met again. This time, the mood was drastically different. The new owner of the elephant was furious. As soon as he saw his friend, he exploded in anger. What the heck did you sell to me? That elephant has been a disaster. He's destroyed all my greenery and trees, and there's elephant dung everywhere. It's even making the house smell. The kids are terrified of him. He's aggressive, massive, and scary. I can't get any sleep because he trumpets all night long. My wife is having nightmares, and now I have to listen to her complaints constantly. It's the worst purchase of my life. The original elephant owner, listening to this tirade, simply shrugged and said, Well, I don't know what to say, but with that attitude, you'll never be able to sell them. A man walked into a local pharmacy with a look of determination on his face. The pharmacy was quiet, save for the soft hum of the air conditioner. The pharmacist, a middle-aged man with a kind face, was busy organizing some medication behind the counter. As the man approached the counter, the pharmacist looked up and greeted him with a friendly smile, ready to assist with whatever he needed. The man, without much preamble, said, I need to buy some birth control pills for my 12-year-old daughter. The pharmacist, taken aback by this unusual request, couldn't hide his surprise. The thought of a 12-year-old girl needing birth control pills was concerning and somewhat shocking to him. He hesitated for a moment, then asked cautiously, Your 12-year-old daughter is already active in bed? The dad of the deadpan expression replied, No, she just lies there like her mother. One evening, a man decided to bring his date back to his place. As they were getting ready for bed, he felt the need to explain his somewhat unusual living situation. He confessed to her, I still live with my parents, and me and my brother share bunk beds, so if you want to change positions, say lettuce, and if you want to go faster, say tomatoes. His date, finding this a bit amusing but willing to go along with it, nodded in understanding. They climbed into the top bunk, trying to be as quiet as possible so as not to disturb his brother sleeping on the bunk below. As things started to heat up between them, the woman remembered the code words the man had mentioned. In the throes of passion, she found herself calling out, Lettuce, lettuce, tomatoes, lettuce, tomatoes, tomatoes. Meanwhile, the younger brother was growing increasingly frustrated. The bed above him was shaking, and he could hear the muffled sounds of his brother and his date. Finally, unable to tolerate the disturbance any longer, the younger brother called out in exasperation. Could you stop making sandwiches? You're getting mayonnaise all over me.